Another podcast sounds dreadful. Brain the size of a planet, and they ask me to introduce their podcast. Call that job satisfaction, because I don't. Hi there, and welcome to Digital Watches are a Pretty Neat Idea. This is Brian, and I'm with my friend Jeff, and we'll be talking about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in all its forms. But before we do that, let's listen to a message from one of our proud sponsors. This episode of Digital Watches are a Pretty Neat Idea is brought to you by Magrathia Custom Planet Builders. Hey Benji, I'm looking to get my own custom planet. Well, Frankie, then you have to go to Magrathia. magra what Magrathia, the most exclusive custom planet builder out there. I thought Magrathia was just a legend. No, Frankie. The only thing legendary about Magrathia is their service. Do tell. The length of the day, the climate, the shade of pink for all the seas are to your exact specifications. They also have an award-winning fjord carver. I'm sold. I'll sub ether radio them right now. Hello, this is Jeff. This is the section I like to call, What in Life, the Universe, and Everything Are They Talking About? This is where I will summarize everything we are talking about this episode. The story starts out with Arthur Dent attempting to stop his house from being knocked down to make way for a bypass. In the middle of his negotiation with the foreman, El Prosser, Ford Prefect enters the story and convinces Arthur to go to the pub with him because he has something very important to tell him. At the pub, Arthur learns that Ford, a field agent for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, has learned that Earth is about to be destroyed. Arthur does not believe his fairy stories and runs out of the pub when he sees they have started knocking down his house. As Arthur is yelling at the people knocking down his house, a Vogon constructor fleet appears in the sky telling Earth that they are going to suffer the same fate as Arthur's house. That is, being destroyed to make way for a hyperspace bypass. Ford grabs Arthur, and they escape the destruction of Earth by hitching a ride on one of the Vogon ships. The Vogons are not happy about that, so the captain of the ship reads them some poetry and then has them thrown off the ship. By a staggeringly improbable chance, the two of them are rescued by the Heart of Gold, a spaceship using the latest technological advance, the Infinite Improbability Drive. The Heart of Gold was stolen by Zaphod Beeblebrox and his Earth companion, Trisha McMillan, or Trillian. There is also a robot on the ship, Marvin, who is manically depressed. They are looking for the mythical planet-building planet of Magrathia, and they found it. Although they have found it, they are not welcome, and an ancient automatic defense system attempts, but fails, to shoot them down. On the planet, the group separates. Zaphod, Trillian, and Ford go exploring and leave Arthur and Marvin behind. Arthur meets Slarty Bartfast, a coastline designer, and Arthur abandons Marvin. He goes with Slarty Bartfast to learn the history of Earth and how it is really a computer designed to discover the actual question of life, the universe, and everything, to which the answer is 42. He was then told the Earth was destroyed five minutes before the program was completed. After the lesson, Arthur is brought to a banquet room where he is reunited with the other three. He also meets the pandimensional mice responsible for contracting the construction of Earth. Since Arthur improbably showed up at the planet, and he was on Earth right up until the end, the mice believe the question is in Arthur's brainwave pattern. They want to buy Arthur's brain to process it and extract the question. At that moment, the police have caught up with Zaphod and are trying to arrest him for stealing the Heart of Gold. The police are shooting at the group who is hiding behind a computer bank. The computer bank explodes. Is that the end of our heroes? Hey Brian, how are you doing today? Hey Jeff, I'm doing great. How about yourself? Oh, not doing bad. I know in the last episode, we said that we were going to talk about the first six episodes of the radio series, but I've decided to break that up into parts one and part two of primary phase because the first four episodes 
match up with the book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where five and six are included in Restaurant at the End of the Universe. So our next episode will be episodes five and six of the radio series. And we're also going to be doing the LP. The first LP, which is a double LP, also matches up perfectly with the first four episodes of the radio series. Great. That's fantastic. Well, that's typical of us to make a change <laughs> right before we even get started, right? That's right. Episode two, and we're already going <laughs> off script. <laughs> We'll be talking about Primary Phase Part 1, the first four episodes of the Primary Phase radio series. Same basic story represented in the double LP. I want to do these simultaneously rather than doing the LPs on their own since the content isn't substantially different. And I also liked hearing the changes that were made from one to the other. A little history, I guess, about the LP. Due to the music... In the radio series, they didn't have the rights to put out an LP version. So they had to re-record the whole thing rather than just taking the radio series and releasing it. And they made some changes. And to me, with rare exception in these first four episodes, every change they made made the story better. Do you feel that way? Oh, yes, definitely. There was a few stumbles. Uh, you know, not that we're going to focus on every detail of the radio show, but in the radio show, there's a couple of little uh, fumbles over uh, the script, and they missed a few of the little neat little jabs that are in there. But uh, I agree. The LP gave them the opportunity to probably record and re-record and come up with the more final version or the more intended version, I could say, of yes. uh, Adams' script. So I agree with that. As we're finding out, there's something about a, a live performance that has its issues. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we'd never find that out. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, the other thing I keep thinking about at the top of my head when I start to think about this particular uh, broadcast that we're working on at the moment it's hard to imagine an audience for one, <laughs> just a yes. regular audience. It's hard to imagine. But for two, I, I don't know where our audience is going to be in terms of their familiarity with the uh, entire story. You know, can we assume that they've read the first book? Can we assume that they at least have an idea of what the storyline's about? Or is there assumptions that we need to start all the way back at the beginning and fill them all in? Well, I guess we are starting all the way at the beginning and I definitely hope that whoever has found this and is listening to it is familiar with at least the first book. There you go. That helps. <laughs> and then I hope if they haven't listened to or read any of the additional, if they read it and follow right along with us, because I certainly could not review any of the books at this point without rereading them. It's going to be fun, actually. I'll, as you know, we'll be doing audio books, so I'll be listening at work, all of the things. So, <laughs> Absolutely. So let's start talking about the Hitchhiker's Guide radio series. Before I even knew there was okay. a radio series, I was listening to the LP that I got. I heard the LP long before the radio series, but after I read the book. And that is where I learned that Ford's name is Prefect, not Perfect. <laughs> well, you know, it's an English thing, you know? The prefects are, are in a lot of English stories. Because, of course, that's what they call, uh, I don't know, a perfect kid, an A student or whatever over in England in some yes. of the school systems. So it's a common word in English language, but certainly not in the American language. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> And then I also looked this up. I didn't do very much research. But between 1938 and 1961, in the UK, there was a car, the Ford Prefect. <laughs> now that I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, so that kind of makes it even funnier. If we would have had a Ford mm -hmm. Prefect in the United States, then mm -hmm. nobody would have ever confused that name. <laughs> yep, that's true. Just to start us off again, the primary phase radio show, according to what I've found out, uh, was originally aired in 1978. Okay, wow. And of course, the book didn't come out until 1979. That's when it started. Okay. 
And that's what gets me is a radio series. I can't believe how long they lasted in the UK because in the United States, I can't say I've ever listened to a first run live radio series broadcast of any subject. <laughs> yeah, the only one I can think of is like, uh, what was that one? Uh, Robot Chicken or... Uh... <laughs> 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 Did you ever hear that? Like, and it's not Robot Chicken. That's a cartoon on a on yeah. the uh, Cartoon Channel, Super Chicken or something like that. It, that I remember that one. That was pretty funny. With this show, there is so much coming at you all at once. It's hard to process and appreciate everything in a single listening. Everything seems to be a joke one way or another. So I've really enjoyed listening to it over and over and over because you catch new things every time that's true every line seems like a punchline, and that's one of the things that creates the open laughter when you're reading his book you know it's just, it's just <laughs> yes it's just all there and it's always available so that's what i really like about it in this first episode ever when ford wants arthur to go to the pub with him arthur talks the prosser into lying in front of the bulldozer in his place and that is all well and good for the introduction, but it really does mm -hmm. not fit Arthur's personality. No, it, no, it doesn't. In the LP, they did away with that whole scene, and they just went straight to the pub. In the book, right. that's when they had Ford talk the Prosser into lying down in front of the bulldozer, which really fit Ford's personality much better. Right. And as we were talking about, <laughs> I feel like um, it's funny. We're, we're talking about the first scene and Arthur's there arguing with the supervisor, Prosser, as you said, and, yes. and trying to keep his house from being knocked over. It's an interesting scene, but you're right. It doesn't fit his personality to be the one who convinces the gentleman Prosser to actually delay while they walk off to the bar for drinks. Okay. so So now we get to this part where if you take the two versions of the radio series and the LP and you merge them together, you actually get the perfect version. Neither one of them did it right on their own, but together it's perfect. Mm -hmm. The radio series has a part with a woman making a speech before tearing Arthur's house down. In it, there are a couple of cheap jokes where she says cruddy little village instead of little country village. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> what she does is great. She mentions that she is christening the yellow bulldozer. That is the first right. time the word yellow has been mentioned, and yellow is <laughs> very important. Normally, one would just say bulldozer, but she specifically mm -hmm. said yellow bulldozer there had to be a reason but we never learn it right. in the radio series they cut that scene right. totally out of the lp and in a scene that describes the vogon ships as yellow there's another parallel the bulldozers knocking down the house are yellow and the vogon ships destroying the earth are yellow but neither <laughs> of the audio drama versions have both <laughs> they each right. have a half right the LP also had the brilliant line about the ships going unnoticed by all these different government agencies and observatories when it was exactly the sort of thing they've been looking for all these years. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, yes. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is that you were talking about some gaffes in the live recording where Arthur drops the word mm -hmm. green when he is talking with Ford, trying to figure out how we got on a Vogon ship. He only says, so we just stuck out our thumb and some bug-eyed monster said, hey, I can take you as far as the Basing Soaks Road about, or some weird, goofy thing like yep. that. Yep. Anyway, mm -hmm. when he gets to the point where Arthur asks about the bug-eyed monster, Ford goes, is green, yes. And it's like, <laughs> well, he didn't say green bug-eyed monster, but in the LP... He got the line correct. Right. So that was my comparing and contrasting the two versions. And I really like that they have that one part where if you put them together, it's perfect. But neither one by itself mm -hmm. is correct. <laughs> I will go back to you for just a little bit. And 
ask okay. if there's any specific jokes or gags that you wanted to discuss more in depth because they're, you know, kind of brilliant. Right. <laughs> there's a couple of things that I think are outstanding. And of course, you talked about one of the parallels where well, the, the yellow ships and the yellow bulldozer. Yes. There's another parallel when uh, Arthur is discussing with Prosser the information and where the information oh, can yes. be found. <laughs> and I know we've talked about this in the past, where it's in the display department, which uh, turns out to be in the basement of a building that has no <laughs> stairs, in a dark area without any light, in a closet, uh, locked in or uh, locked in a closet with inside of a desk. I believe it's the bottom of a locked filing cabinet in a disused lavatory. <laughs> Oh, that's it. You're right. That's the word. And, uh, of course, there's the other parallel that happens when the Vogon captain is basically telling everyone on Earth what's about to happen. And he goes about explaining that um, all this information was available at Alpha Centauri and they could have certainly read it and reviewed <laughs> yes, it. Yeah, it's only 50 light years <laughs> Had away. they wanted to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I think that's pretty brilliant. Oh, when they get onto the ship, I think it's neat that they uh, refer to the the people that allow them on the ship are actually the cooks the people providing the food for the vogons the yes. dentrasi of course it, it's just a subtle thing but i think that's amazing that they talk about the squalid nature of the area that they're in of course dentrasi has to be a version of detritus which is <laughs> <laughs> basically things thrown yes. about <laughs> Which I think is brilliant, you know. It's just, just one of those word selections that you really appreciate from a good yes. author. The other thing that I thought was fascinating, I wondered at first, because and this is a variation from the book and from, I, I think, even the LP, because in the radio show, he mentions the third worst poet in all of existence is a man named Paul Neil Mile uh, yes. Johnson from Redbridge. <laughs> it actually turns out that this guy is a friend of his, a friend of Adam's. They went to school together, and <laughs> he was a poet, and they were on a literary group that, that published a literary paper. The two of them did go to college together, or at the same location. So I thought it was pretty funny, I guess, in, in the later yeah, edition. Sorry. I believe that he is actually the worst. Vogon is the third, but the Paul whatever. Oh, right. You're right. Is the Look, worst Lord. and perished with his plant. <laughs> Paul Neil Miles <laughs> yes. Johnson. That's right. The worst poet in history. That's correct. But I thought it was funny because I wondered when I heard the radio version, I thought this is the first version. I wonder whether or not this is a real person. And it, it turns out that it is a real person. <laughs> but of course, in the LP version, I believe they've changed the name. And in the book, the name has also been I changed. think it's scrambled more than changed. Yes, yes, it is scrambled. Yes, exactly. So there are there are a couple of jokes that I think most people are familiar with, even if they haven't read the book. One of my favorites is the joke about safe, where Arthur, when he finds out he's on this ship, says, are we safe? Ford says, yes, we're in the galley cabin of a Vogon, one of the Vogon constructor. And he's like, well, this must be some strange usage of the word safe I wasn't previously aware of. <laughs> so <laughs> that was one of my absolute favorite jokes. Um, and I'm going to have a, a lot of these. It's like, I'm going to say, this was my favorite joke. And then, oh, no, no, no. This was my favorite joke. Oh, no, no, no. This was my favorite <laughs> joke. The bit about safe just absolutely cracked me up when I read it the first time. Uh, we didn't mention the Babelfish. The, the oh, babel okay. fish yes. is a fish that feeds off of brain waves, and so if you have one in your ear, you can understand any form of language spoken because of some convoluted reason that he has come up with. But it doesn't explain why he can read signs. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah, that's a good uh, point. The other thing is, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the Earth was originally listed simply as harmless, but because Ford is a field agent who's doing research for future editions, he said it's been edited and changed, and then Arthur 
asks what the change was, and he said it is now mostly harmless, which really didn't make Arthur feel any better. <laughs> I love the fact that he um, actually uh, says that my editor had to trim it down a bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He'd been on the planet for seven years and obviously written a lot about the planet. And then he said my editor had to trim it down a bit. And now it's mostly, mostly harmless. harmless. Yes. <laughs> and then you did mention, or we do want to mention, Vogon Poetry, uh, which you were talking about before with the Paul Niels Millstone Johnson or whatever his name was. The mm -hmm. Poetry Reading Chairs which is basically a torture device that the Vogons strap you to to read poetry at you. Again, just... <laughs> and then listening to the, the Vogon poetry is like a bunch of gurgles and wretches, and it's just a nightmare. <laughs> now we can go on to episode two. We do get to start out hearing the Far Out in the Uncharted Backwaters passage where they have the digital watch joke. So that's mm -hmm. how they open episode two. Right. Right. So I assumed that that particular joke in episode two is one of yeah, your favorites. That is my favorite joke. <laughs> Forget about what I said about that safe thing. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is my favorite. Well, I got to tell you, the episode starts off with them you know being drugged through the ship by a, a mindless vogon guard and he's constantly repeating resistance is useless <laughs> resistance is useless and i and obviously i had to laugh because there's no chance that they would have been referencing a star trek reference there but certainly makes you wonder if it was the other way around <laughs> <laughs> because this this came Correct. way did way. star trek steal it from them well i'm not saying they stole it but it came way before <laughs> it did and did it did indeed so this would have been like in 78 and it would have preceded even the next gen the next yes. gen didn't come out until later <laughs> but then i also like uh i don't know if you're going to get into some of your other your other favorites here but one of the other things that i thought is delightful is when arthur is complaining that he says to uh ford oh, man i wish i'd listened to what my mother used to say <laughs> yes. to me when i was a kid and then ford said well what did she say and he said i don't know yeah. i didn't listen yes i definitely have that <laughs> one listed me. that's the perfect <laughs> response <laughs> so ford and arthur are doing a back and forth review of the Vogon poetry trying to bluff their way out of being thrown off the ship and after it doesn't work and they're taken away by the guy that says resistance is useless, the captain is kind of having a conversation with himself. And he's thinking one of the last things that they said. He's like, counterpoint the surrealism of the underlying metaphor. Death's too good for them. <laughs> so <laughs> they're placating him was so bad that death is even too good for them. <laughs> When Ford was showing Arthur the entry about the Vogons in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it said that you could forget about getting a lift. He also said that the book was out of date and he was updating it because he mentioned the bit about the Dentrassi helping hitchhikers and how he's going to have to include it in the revised edition. Do you think he's also going right. to include the fact that the Vogons will space you immediately or after reading poetry to you? <laughs> I would assume he would, but you, you never know what the editor is going to do. <laughs> yeah, I'd still forget about get, getting a lift from the Vogons. All right, so they're now they've been thrown into the airlock, and they're sitting in the airlock there, waiting for the doors to open and them to get spaced out into space. Arthur talked about not wanting to go to heaven with a headache because he'd be all cross and he wouldn't enjoy it. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, Ford takes the opportunity to make a joke about rescuing them with a button that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> they have to go through the countdown of improbability in this episode. They do. There's just levels of improbability being read over some kind of an intercom where they're basically having all kinds of hallucinations. They are told not to panic because they've been rescued from certain death by the heart of gold, and pretty soon everything will be okay and just kind of hang in there. And then, of course, it all comes down. We get introduced to Zaphod, Trillian, and Marvin, and Eddie, the shipboard computer, on the heart of gold. Marvin 
Is the paranoid android or an extremely depressed robot, however you would like to describe him. He was a prototype of the serious cybernetics general people personality and didn't work out so well. <laughs> no, it's an amazing concept that they have with Marvin. And Marvin provides a good deal of, of humor throughout the book. And uh, certainly, even in the movies, there's a lot there that, that oh, absolutely. we will be going over. Here on the radio, radio show, he's just pretty much just a manic depressive individual that has yes. a brain the size of a planet and uh, <laughs> is being told to do menial tasks. <laughs> but I did want to point out, and I don't know whether you had something that you wanted to talk about when you're going through the improbability drive. And yeah, the improbability as those factors were dropping, yes. different things were happening. Near the end of that process, <laughs> this is just incredible to me because it's just really funny. Arthur turns to Ford and said, oh, uh, by the way, uh, Ford, there's an infinite number of monkeys that want to talk to you about the script they've written yes. for Hamlet yes. uh, that they've worked out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's absolutely amazing about that particular line is, of course, it's in reference to what's called the infinite monkey theorem, which has existed for a long time. When I was looking up the information about the infinite monkey theorem, which basically states that if you had an infinite number of monkeys on working on an infinite number of typewriters, eventually they would write out every piece of literature, every piece of important right. story that's ever been written, um, <laughs> right. given an infinite amount of time. It's a logical exercise in what the infinite improbability drive is supposed to be or how it was created, because even though an infinite number of monkeys on an infinite number of typewriters in an infinite number of time would eventually write out all these great pieces of literature. That meant that even though it was highly unlikely yes. or highly improbable, there yes. was a probability that function or that that absolute situation would occur. <laughs> and in looking that up, I, I came up with my my new favorite word, and that's dactylographic. Okay. <laughs> this is what they refer to this theorem as, dactylographic that, that theorem. Is, that is a good word. <laughs> in, in looking this up, I also found that some people decided it would be a good idea to test out the theory. Uh, with that the would be a, a tall order. <laughs> they actually put a bunch of... <laughs> Yeah, they actually put a bunch of monkeys into a room with some computer keyboards. And in the end, they got five pages of written material that were mostly S's until one of the monkeys grabbed a rock and smashed the keyboard yes. to a thousand pieces. Yeah. In all of the things that they were talking about that was happening to them, the monkeys in the Shakespeare mm -hmm. is the only thing that's probable. Ford turning into a penguin, not probable. Right. <laughs> Arthur's arm floating away, not probable. The seashore, the buildings washing up and down, why the not mm -hmm. probable. Those are all things that are totally impossible. But then finally, they came up with the actual thing that is improbable. <laughs> right, exactly. In the same vein of improbability, there was a really nice addition to the LP that wasn't in the radio series. And it's only two words. <laughs> so Zaphod is looking at the <laughs> monitor and he recognizes Ford. And he knows that the ship just picked him up and he's trying to figure out mm -hmm. how this could have possibly happened that the ship picked him up when they were at infinite improbability. So he wanted to do the calculation. So that's when we meet, we meet Eddie, the computer. He's immediately annoying. And Zaphod's like, nope, nope. I'll just mm -hmm. use a sheet of paper. So he's talking to Trillian, and <laughs> they've already stated the probability of being rescued from space in the 30 seconds without spacesuits. Lots of improbability, but nowhere near infinite. But that same probability was the mm -hmm. telephone number of a flat at a party that Arthur went to, and he discovered a girl who he didn't ever have anything happen with. And then it so happens that Zaphod was at that same party and the girl that Arthur was with was Trillian. And and when it all comes together, Eddie says on the LP, improbability complete. 
even though Zaphod was using a piece of paper, <laughs> Eddie was still doing all of the calculations. And as soon as they hit the infinite improbability, he's like, probability factor complete. That's all I wanted to mention about that and how it's like they listen to the, the radio series. They're like, oh, you know what we need? We need this little insert. And they put all those on the LP. So I found that to be very fun to listen to. Okay, now so now we can go on to episode three. Right. Just before we step away to episode three, I, I know we're going to get into this later because it really isn't going to be in, in effect, I think, until we talk about the book. They don't talk about either in the book or, or I'm sorry, in the LP or in the radios uh, about how Zaphod steals the ship or no, why he no, actually they don't. has I the mean, ship. You know, <laughs> you know so it, yeah, it, it's interesting. Yeah, because you have no idea. However, the reason he stole it happens it's like so the next episode is the reason he stole the ship however <laughs> we don't know that's the reason nor do we ever right. find out exactly exactly so it, it's quite fascinating but the other thing i think is funny is when when you think about it since we know more about the concept of what happened and how this this ship got created and it's the first of its kind the activation of the improbability drive has this ripple effect and I think the ripple effect is part of what goes on throughout the story all the way through to the end of what we right. would call the fourth episode here. I still think that yes. the ripple, it's still rippling. It's, I mean, it's still adding up all the factors and everything that happens is a result of the fact that this improbability field, if you will, is rotating around the four main characters and how they're all right. bundled together. So, you know, it's, it's like a, a string theory, if you will, of, of the, uh, the ripple effect of this particular uh, yes. uh, ship. We can talk about episode three. Okay. So the episode three, of course, starts where they are orbiting the mythical, well, yeah, not it was really a, mythical, well, but actual it had fallen um, into planet of Magrathea. Right. So they're orbiting around Magrathea. And um, so the first thing I want to say is I did not catch any script differences between the radio series and the LP. Mm -hmm. It's like they changed very little, if anything, in this episode. They start out with a monologue like they did, but this time they do the part where they have the men were real men and women were real women and small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri were real small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri. But then right after that, there is a joke that stings because there is too much, I do not want to call it, truth but i will call it an accurate assessment of the way the world really is it mentions that many men became extremely rich but it was perfectly natural and nothing to be ashamed of because no one was really poor at least no one worth speaking of so i'm like wow that that wouldn't play very good in in today's world and i remember that joke being funny to me 40 years ago mm -hmm. but now now it's just it's like the news <laughs> <laughs> well and of course you 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 happen to flip slide right past the thing that makes that opening monologue important and that is after he says okay. men were real men women were real women and small furry creatures from alpha centauri were real small furry creatures from alpha centauri he says and all dared to brave unknown terrors to do mighty deeds to boldly split infinitives that no man had split before. <laughs> and of course, that is a direct <laughs> reference to Star Trek. <laughs> Not only the part about men yes. were men and women were women. I mean, after the episodes aired for Star Trek, there was a great controversy about how you know, sexualized the women characters were and how overly, uh, oh, I don't even know how you would call, you'd probably call him a predator now, <laughs> Captain Kirk is, when it comes to the yes. females in on the show. And, of course, the one thing that everybody jumped on right away when Star Trek first came out was they split the infinitive. It should be to go boldly where no man had gone before, not to boldly go. So right. this is a direct reference right. to... Uh, Star Trek, and in that it is a direct reference to Star Trek, I like to believe that the small furry creatures that are being referred to are dribbles. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, the Tribble is, is a fa- fascinating creature, by the way, you know? And that took me down a rabbit hole that uh, really had, had me going for quite some time. I was quite entertained with that particular <laughs> rabbit hole. Well, you mentioned that uh, Captain Kirk could have been considered a predator. Zaphod had a third arm attached specifically for Trillian. Yes. <laughs> So, so, so they're not above any kind of predator type of uh, <laughs> thing. So anyway, they're now orbiting this mythical planet of Magrathia, but nobody actually believes it is. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden there's this fanfare and this announcement saying it was Magrathia. But they keep going even though they were told to go back and they get farther and there's another warning and they get farther and then they shoot the missiles. So another joke that everybody knows is about the whale and the petunias. <laughs> Their guidance system is jammed. Nobody can fly the ship. Arthur's like, there's an improbability button right here. What happens if I press it? Nobody is doing anything. So at the last moment, he just hits the button because they have got nothing to lose. And then you get a bowl of petunias and a surprise-looking sperm whale. <laughs> surprise-looking. Yes. That has always, okay, yes, he he would be surprised looking, but I wouldn't expect that to be put in there, but it's it's absolutely perfect. (laughs) Before we get too much about the whale, there's the petunias. The only thing that went through the mind of the petunias is, oh, no, not again. (laughs) One of my favorite lines. If we knew why they said Mm -hmm. this, we might understand the world a whole lot better, the universe a whole lot better. (laughs) It will be a long Mm -hmm. time before you find out why the Petunia said, oh, no, not again. But he will answer it. Yes, and that's another one of those. But you got to wait a while. Amazing pieces now. And, of course, you want to talk about the whale? (laughs) The the whale in the room? (laughs) So not only does the Petunias appear, but this whale appears. He has to kind of suddenly come to kind of figure out that he is a whale, right. come to grips with being a whale before he comes to grips with being a whale no more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't write down all of the, the things that he said, but it's basically <laughs> he's plummeting to the ground and he's coming up with names for his his tail and his stomach and wind and wind must be very important because there's a hell of a <laughs> lot of it. And, and then he sees this big round type of thing that has to have a big name like ground and then it's like the saddest thing in all of the books is the whale going i wonder if it'll be friends with me before he just (laughs) splatters against the, the ground and bursts into a bunch of whale meat that they end up coming across as they as they disembark the heart of gold that's one of the funny lines, too. Of course, when they're in the heart of gold and they've landed on the planet, they ask the computer, you know, what the environmental conditions are. <laughs> and the environmental conditions basically <laughs> yeah. are every, everything's fine, but it smells a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my gosh, technology is really advanced, isn't it? <laughs> they can actually smell the air. And <laughs> Yes. They can smell the air. Yes. <laughs> So they've landed on the planet. They find an entrance or a cave into the planet. And even though it's a deserted planet, Zaphod tells Arthur to stay out here with the robot and guard the entrance. And he's like, well, guard it from what? And, you know, who knows? So (laughs) Ford and Trillian and Zaphod all go into the planet, leaving Arthur and Marvin. And this is where we are introduced to Slarty Barfast. The coastline designer. Correct. Who then was basically sent there to get Arthur. And he brings Arthur into the planet to go down to the factory floor. You know, forget what I said about that safe thing in the digital watches joke. This was one of my favorite jokes. (laughs) (laughs) Is is when he's like, come on now or you will be late. And Arthur's like, late for what? Well, what's your name? My name's Dent, Arthur Dent. The late... Arthur Dent. It's kind of a threat, you know. I can. I'm not very good at them, but I can. I've, I've been heard totally they're been very, very effective. effective, you know. It's yeah. like 
<laughs> yes, I've heard they're very effective. <laughs> so ever since, I'll say, 1981 or whenever I read that, mm-hmm. I have wanted to use that as a threat <laughs> and have never had the opportunity. I can't even imagine. <laughs> Okay, so Arthur goes with Slarty Bartfast down to the factory floor through some hyperspace thing because they need to go into a different dimension where the planet building happens. So Slarty Bartfast is telling him that it might be a little bit of disturbing. It it scares the willies out of me, (laughs) this hyperspace track they have to go through. So they go through it, and then somewhere around this point, they do the monologue about man being the third most intelligent creature on the planet Earth, as opposed to the second, which most independent observers have thought. The second most intelligent was the dolphins, and the single first most intelligent was the mice. So they have determined that man was the third, but what I liked was about the dolphins. Man has always thought that he was smarter than the dolphins because he created the wheel and New York and wars. And the dolphins felt that they were more intelligent than man for all the same reasons. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And the dolphins had actually known about the impending doom of the earth and were trying to warn man about it. But it was always just confused as, you know, just whistling for tidbits and punching footballs and that kind of a thing. (laughs) But their final message was so long and thanks for all the fish, which was like a triple backflip through a hoop while whistling the Star Spangled Banner. And that has always confused me, and I've never researched enough to find out why it was the Star Spangled Banner. But this is clearly a British production. It was never really intended for the United States. But they're mentioning the Star Spangled Banner. So I'm always, is this a crack against the United States, or is this a jab or a joke? I've never been able to figure out, if it was a joke, what the joke was. So that is always something that has confused me. Well, I wonder if they even have animal park theme parks in England. Maybe that's why the reference is for the United States, because, of course, we, we have them. I'm not even sure. I don't, I don't even know. Do they have that kind of aquarium, a sea world in, uh, in London? I don't know. I... I, I actually don't know that. Maybe. <laughs> that's what I'm wondering. Maybe that's why that's why they don't have a reference yeah. to the an English version because um, we had. That, that's lots actually of them. an answer that I like. <laughs> I like that answer regardless if it's true. <laughs> well, well, we'll work with that. We like that. That works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They describe the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when they're describing the book as being apocryphal or at least wildly inaccurate i'll say it will be the same thing about our podcast a hundred percent of course this is where they actually discuss some of the core processes that the that the books are all revolved around right here in this part of the story and you're about to go into that i assume i think i am so we get to the fourth episode where Arthur goes to the factory floor and he is given a history lesson by Slarty Bartfast, who is telling them, and this is something that cracks me up, they get to learn the history of the learning of the ultimate answer to the ultimate question, the life, the universe, and everything. And he says, we have a tape recording of the event. (laughs) A tape recording. (laughs) Well, he actually says that while they're orbiting this planet, they also say they have a tape recording at that point, yes. too. And it's pretty funny. <laughs> right. It's like tape recordings <laughs> on the LP. I guess they realize that doesn't sound right. So Slarty Bartfast wakes up Arthur and tells him that he's been in a deep trance absorbing the data from a Magrathian computer matrix archive cells. Oh, so there you go. <laughs> in, in the LP, they're just beaming it right into his head instead of watching a tape recording. Right. He gets to learn that they wanted to find out what the ultimate answer to the ultimate question was, and they built a computer, and the computer gave them the answer 42, and nobody liked that answer. They wanted the question, and he's like, well, I can't tell you the question, but I know who can, the computer I'm going to build next. And then he builds that computer, which is called 
the earth. <laughs> in, in the reviewing of the historical tapes or the um, beaming of the information into Arthur's brain, we get to meet Broom Fondle and Magic Thighs. <laughs> <laughs> And by yes. far, they have to be the greatest names in the book, <laughs> from my perspective. Yes. Magic Thighs keeps the whole concept of, uh, what am I trying to say? He keeps saying that I may or may not be Magic Thighs. <laughs> and what we demand is the yes. absence of solid facts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, what they demand is rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. Right, right. That's what Broom Fondle finally says. <laughs> yes. Which, yes. Um, I may or may amazing. not. And <laughs> I also like, if you don't stop this machine, the philosophers will go on strike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who's that going to inconvenience? <laughs> Oh, it'll hurt, buddy. It'll hurt. <laughs> it'll hurt. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's so funny. So the philosophers mm -hmm. are, are all upset because, like you said, they're going to go on strike. They believe they're going to be out of a job when he gives this answer. Correct. And the deep thought, the computer keeps trying to stop them, but they won't listen. And he's like, it's going to take me a little while to 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 get this all figured out. So if you were smart, you'd get yourself agents and you'd get on the chat shows and you'd argue. And they're like, you'd be on the gravy train for life. And they're looking at each other like, man, that's thinking. Why can't we come up with ideas? And they're like, I guess our minds are too highly trained. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's another great line. Because <laughs> uh, Deep Thought uses uh, seven and a half million years to come up with the answer. And then builds the Earth, which yes. is supposed to take 10 million years before it, it yes. uh, provides the question. Spits out its answer. Yeah. Yes. And the question, of course, is what the mice, who are actually what uh, pan-galactic individuals are trying to... Pan-dimensional. Pan-dimensional individuals, right, that are trying to understand this so that they can get back to their favorite sport of ultra cricket. Ultra cricket, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's where you run up and hit people for no reason. <laughs> yep. When Deep Thought finally is going to divulge the answer of 42, he can't just spit it out. He just keeps dragging it on and dragging <laughs> it on. It's like, which cracks me up because nothing has changed. If you watch any reality show contest, mm -hmm. like, America's Got Talent or whatever, where they're going to reveal a result. It's always after the break. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the way they do it. There was another thing that just absolutely cracked me up as into why did he decide to put this in here? I mean, it's hysterical, but it's just so out of the blue. Arthur is talking to Slarty Bartfast, and he says... I'm having this tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle. <laughs> and that sets off a whole wormhole chain reaction where his words go back in time millions and billions of miles away and emerge during peace talks. <laughs> in one of the languages, it's the absolute worst possible insult you could give in that language. In the description, they're talking about one of the generals sitting there in his black jeweled battle shorts. I'm like, <laughs> black jeweled battle shorts? What? Where does this come from? What? Why is this put in here? So anyway, there's this tremendous war that started because of that. Mm -hmm. And then they finally realize what happened and they decide to join forces and go to the place that it started which is really a deserted planet because he was on Magrathea at the time. So I don't know where the small dog was, but... <laughs> well, no, no, no. It, it, they eventually determined that it was from Arthur or from the planet Earth. Okay, so they, they decided it was English. Yep. So Arthur said it. They determined that Earth was the language that this happened and that caused the war. So they're going to do something about it and fly this armada. But due to a gross miscalculation of scale, the entire fleet was swallowed by a small dog. 
<laughs> another one of those things that just <laughs> makes me laugh and laugh and laugh because it's just absurd. <laughs> it's absolutely absurd. Yep, absolutely. When it comes to the the conversation floating through that wormhole, that's to me is a part of the spinning out of the uh, improbability drive, the vortices, if you will, of the improbability drive, just still spinning off and spinning off. And of course, Arthur, as well as the other the other folks in the story, all have different varied effects, but they all spin like the vortices of the drive. This is one of those little spin-offs that gets played into the story. Oh, absolutely. On the LP, mm-hmm. they changed the part with the mice. Okay. The, the mice on the LP and not in the, the radio series, they say, we've been in this answer business for some 17 and a half million years. Right. The other mouse goes, oh, longer, surely. And he's like, <laughs> no, just seems longer. <laughs> Oh, gosh. And then in the radio series, they had something that was just hysterical because of the the voice modulation that they used for the actor, where one of the mice is talking about, if we have to run this program again, just the thought of that gives me the screaming (laughs) heebie-jeebies. Zaphod was going to be the the agent for Arthur's brain. Mm -hmm. So he was doing the negotiation of getting the question out of... Arthur's brain and he's like well we don't want to be reasonably rich we're we're holding out for extremely rich <laughs> and he's like you drive a hard bargain Beeble rocks <laughs> those lines are delivered in a way that are just absolutely hysterical especially with the the high-pitched chipmunk type voice that they mm-hmm. use for the mm-hmm. for the mice that's right so if they could have kept that on the LP it would have been better mm-hmm. and then also on the LP They go a little farther. Real early in the discussion on the radio series, the cops come and they run out. Mm -hmm. But they start asking Arthur, well, we we just want an answer that sounds good. Right. If it's between running the program again or taking the money and running, then I, for one, could use the exercise. (laughs) So they just want something that sounds good. And one of them is like that Bob Dylan song. It's like, how many roads must a man walk down? Ooh, hey, that (laughs) hat has a ring to it. That's got some legs, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They decided they need to buy his brain to dissect it. They can't just read his brain. They've got to, you know, process Mm -hmm. it and slice it and dice it. But they'd give him uh, an electronic brain that he wouldn't even know the difference. (laughs) And uh, Zaphod is like, you'd be programmed... To say, I don't understand. Where's the T? (laughs) And Arthur immediately goes, what? (laughs) They're like, see what I mean? As we've mentioned, the police arrive. And then there's another joke that does not play so well in 2021 as it may have in 1978. Oh, come now. (laughs) Because in their back and forth (laughs) with the cops. Oh, I think it's pretty relevant (laughs) well i guess in the 70s it it may have been but nothing has changed he's like i don't go around gratuitously shooting people and then bragging about it afterward and see these space ranger bars i go around gratuitously shooting people and then agonize about it afterwards to my girlfriend (laughs) 40 years ago it was hysterical now now it hurts a little oh yes so, again, they're they're hiding behind a computer bank. The cops are shooting the computer bank. There's an explosion, and the episode ends. Whew. What a lot. That, it's, it's amazing to this point. Absolutely. In the next episode, we will talk about episodes five and six and the single LP that matches up with that, which we will find out the fate of our heroes. And... We're hoping that we are going to be able to put out episodes on the first Thursday of every month because Thursday is very important because I believe so far this whole thing has happened on Thursday. (laughs) Yep. Coincidentally, but true. (laughs) I don't think they've gone a a second day. This is all a single day. That's right. (laughs) At least we'll never know, right? We will, we, no, we will never, we will never know. 
All right, Brian, it was great uh, talking with you about this again. I can't wait for our next episode. I'm looking so, forward to it. Say goodbye, Brian. Goodbye, Brian. <laughs> goodbye. Thank you for listening to Digital Watches Are a Pretty Neat Idea. Look for us the first Thursday of every month for a new episode. A very special thanks goes out to Luke, Max, Greg, and Tim Lesnick for arranging and performing our opening theme. We would also like to thank our talented friends and family for their voice work on our introductions and commercials. A special thanks for the opening portrayal of Marvin, the paranoid android, goes out to my uncle, Jim Berard, gifter of the books, who also has a brain the size of a planet. Visit our website at digitalwatchesareaprettyneatidea.buzzsprout.com. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube as Digital Watches Are a Pretty Neat Idea. If you would like to contact us, our email is digitalwatchespodcast at gmail.com. Send us a message on Twitter at Watches Idea. <laughs>